all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or at the web. VeteransRadio.org is our new URL, VeteransRadio.org. Where we're on the web 24-7, you can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.org. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at LegalHelpForVeterans.com We're going to recognize today on uh, Veterans Radio, this is Black History Month. We've got a couple of good interviews to talk about some of our uh, African American uh, military members. You know, this is uh, about 19, I think, percent of the military are African Americans. And, uh, we, you know, kind of we all remember, I think, uh, General Colin Powell, a four star general, uh, what he did in, in his time in the service. And even today, we've got a Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, who is a African American and a four star general in his time. And uh, he's now been appointed to lead all that as the Secretary of Defense. The, in the last year, we've had a two-star Marine General Lorna Malak, uh, African-American woman, um, elevated, and, and her uh, area of expertise is cybersecurity. Very interesting. And, you know, some of this is uh, recent history. Some of it's kind of older history. The first black female uh, Brigadier General uh, and Army nurse, Hazel Johnson uh, Brown, received her stars in 1979 so not all that long ago so we've got a rich history here we want to talk a little bit about it we're going to first up talk with marine gunny sergeant retired uh, as a representative of the national association of black women veterans they're going to talk about an issue that they're interested in and that is the uh, ability for the service academies to use race in consideration of admissions because the point that uh, is being made here is you ought to have an officer core that reflects your enlisted core and we don't have that we don't have a big component of black uh, officers and that really starts with opportunities at West Point uh, as I may have mentioned the Secretary of Defense former four-star general Lloyd Austin was a West Point grad so that's an interesting conversation. And then we're going to reach back and talk a little historical context. So stick around. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today, Marine retired, Gunny Sergeant Twyla Rochelle Cawthon. Uh, welcome to Veterans Radio. Thank you so much. I'm a Marine veteran. That's fine. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> well, you're, they're always uh, Marines, right? Uh, it never really ends. And you actually have a, a tremendous legacy of service uh, post-active uh, duty in the Marine Corps. You're a retired educator. You're very active with the American Legion. You're very active with Girls State. Uh, you've, you're a member, an active member of the East Coast Marine Corps Drill Instructors Association. Uh, and uh, uh, you're a Steelers fan, so we could talk about all of those things. <laughs> but, oh, that's cool. <laughs> but, but what we're going to talk about is your uh, relationship uh, with the National Association of Black Military Women, 
Um, you're the chaplain for the Brooklyn, New York division of the National Association of Black Military Women. But before we get into that, how did a nice kid like you from uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania area, I think, uh, uh, end up in the Marine Corps? Well, I had uh, finished all my credits for school, and all the colleges that were trying to reach out to me were colleges that were out of the state. My father has one child on this earth, me, and he wasn't going to let me leave out of the state. And I had, I was a student that was active in school, and I had held a, a host of a, an event every year at the school where we had different people coming in talking about careers. And I was actually friends with the Marine recruiter downtown. Now, the Marine recruiter had no idea that I was going to come down there. I actually went to the Army recruiter, but he, he wasn't talking right. So uh, <laughs> ended up uh, joining the Marines when my, my recruiter was Jesse Ferguson, the third, one of the best recruiters ever because he didn't lie. Well, it's really, it's really surprising how many people I talked to who had good recruiters and, and remember their name and you know stayed with them the whole time, stayed connected. Now, how long did you serve in the Marine Corps, uh, Gunny Sergeant? A uh, few months of uh, 12 years. I went in in uh, 1979, and I got out in 1991. And as I said, you've uh, had a really impressive career post-service. Uh, give us a little thumbnail, maybe flesh in some of the things I mentioned uh, that you want to highlight. Uh, let's see. I was, uh, as, I, as you mentioned, I'm a retired educator. I was a former police officer. I'm a decorated police officer in Akron. Had two life-saving missions that uh, that I, I actually received accommodation for. Mm, let's see. I belong to the American Legion. I am the past department commander in Washington, D.C. I am the national chaplain, which is the sky pilot for the 20 and 4, which is the American Legion Women's Honorary Society. I'm the first graduate of the National American Legion College from the District of Columbia. I belong to AMVETS, DAV, Women Veterans Alliance, Montfort Point Marines, National Association of Black Military uh, Women, of course, but National uh, Black Veterans, NAPVETS, and just a host of, uh, I can't even name all the different things I belong to, and I actually put time in them. It's not just the name on the rolls for them. But, yes, uh, we do a whole lot of advocacy for homeless veterans. I deal with trying to corp to sculpt out pieces of, of executive orders or to try to get a focus on military sexual trauma and PTSD and not just that for the veteran, but some therapy services for the veteran's family members who are also disaffected because that's the population that people are ignoring. Absolutely. The children live up in these households. In these households. So yeah. It's just a whole lot of things. Homelessness with veterans, homelessness with women veterans is on the rise. In fact, we're the largest population of homeless women on the street are women veterans. They can't take their children in the shelters with them. They can't take their... Uh, Oftentimes, they can't take their spouses. Their spouses were not veterans as well. It's just a whole lot of things. So there's a whole lot that we're dealing with, and we just try to do it piece by piece. And the National Association of Black Military Women, that's really what it is. It's focusing about trying to make veterans whole. Well, it's such an important uh, uh, organization because there is an increase in women ve- uh, in the military, thus an increase in women veterans. Uh, there's certainly a high percentage of uh, African Americans uh, make up the military forces today. I think it's something like 19% of the troops, and women make up about 16% of the troops. But there's a there's a disparity in the number of officers, uh, black officers. Uh, I think it's 9% as compared to 19% of the troops. So there's still a whole lot of work to do, and you've probably seen that progression since you joined up in 1979. But talk about some of the work that still needs to be done and that the National Association of Black Military Women are working on. We need to increase the input of qualified young black men and young black women to join the military and join officer ranks as well because where you might have numbers coming in on the enlisted side, 
officer ranks start getting thin after they are O threes. And by the time you come to the field grade or general grade, you can count them on one hand. And I thought that I would see an increase in the Marine Corps as far as overall officer improvement of minorities, period. And there's an increase. The largest increase were Hispanics, but blacks and Asians, the numbers went down. And some of this is just getting ex- uh, enough folks in the funnel, but then as they go up in years, at, you know, at, as you say, you stayed till 12 years, those next eight or so are the ones where you've got to get the right kind of assignments and you got to know the right people. Um, it, it It is a numbers game, but there's clearly also a bias that, that exists in life in general, but also in the military, isn't there? It's true. As a matter of fact, the officers that were black that I served with, and one of them was actually Arthur Ashe's brother, Johnny Ashe. He was a captain at Camp Lejeune who couldn't seem to get past captain and ended up getting out of the Marine Corps as a captain along with Captain Larry Ray Sims. And I'm calling these persons out by name because these are phenomenal black men who had excellent quality degrees from from upper echelon schools and high scores, but they could not seem to get past that wall. And there was a study that was out some years ago where black officers were interviewed and were asked about black Marine officers. And they said that the biggest thing is that I'm asked to be twice as good or three times as better as my, my peer. And I'm also asked that I have to assimilate, I have to acclimate, I have to make all the adjustments in life in order to even be considered. And so that was tough. And for me, being where I worked in every place I was assigned, even though I was enlisted, we as enlisted people were able to help the black officers better than they could actually help us. You know, and, and, you know, this is a uh, problem uh, that exists in the country uh, as people don't necessarily appreciate the um work and the quality of the, of individuals but let me go back to a comment you made about enough qualified young black men and women entering mm-hmm. the service and mm-hmm. i you know i ask a lot of folks this question because we have a current recruiting crisis in all all of the services maybe marines a little less but uh, otherwise we're, we're kind of falling short of our manpower goals and, and are we doing enough to encourage qualified uh, young black men and women to see the opportunities that exist in, in a military service? No, we're not. And that's because well, there's a lot of factors. One, corporate America offers higher salaries and, and better opportunities in a lot of ways. Um, you have a lot of people who might have family members that were service members, and they see their parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles who try to apply for their disability cases have to go through all types of red tape only to be denied year after year after year. And so they're kind of chagrined as to, wow, so you give this time of your life and this part of your life to the military and this is how they do you. And that's just across the board as well because that's not only just the experience of of black civilian men and women, but everyone. And then the climate of this country, the question is, what does it mean to be patriotic? We're in a, and we have been, I'll say, for the past, I'm going to say, probably about 14 years in a, in a great divide as far as loyalty and patriotism to this country and what that really means because of, there's so much of a divide between the, the, the uh, political factions, extreme ideologies on both sides, the biases that we see in media reporting, and the overall prison of pipeline system that's taking our young people at an early age and, and no correction in sight. When you can't get qualified urban, and I was taught in an urban community, and I was thinking about how many students I actually taught that by the time they got out of high school within the next year were eligible to have even considered applying for the military. And the numbers are low and short. Some because they couldn't have passed the test or passed numbers so low. Others because they wouldn't have passed the psychological because they are traumatized. They're not trauma services for the communities when, and when uh, tragedies occur. 
How do you think a child feels if in the summertime someone gets shot on my sidewalk in my house in my, or, in my, or in my house or in the sidewalk in my neighborhood and I have to walk back and forth this same sidewalk in the fall to school? And I have to deal with that thinking, am I going to get shot going to school? Or I'm going to get a stray bullet going to school or, or just any number of things. I'm at home in the house and the stray bullet comes in the house and hits and kills one of the persons in their household. There isn't any trauma therapy for these people. And this is where we are recruiting, supposedly, the next generation of, of service members. And it's just not happening. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, there are a lot of factors as why why the recruiting goals are missed. And those are certainly some of them. And, and mm-hmm. But you pose the question, and this is certainly an American Legion uh, statement coming out of you, I think, when you asked, what does it mean to be patriotic? Because that's... That's sort of at the core of it all. Do you owe something to the country? Does this country owe something to you? What do, what do you view as, what's your answer, Twyla, to, to the question of what does it mean to be patriotic? For me, it's loyalty to this country, even if I don't agree with all the policies that are in place. I've seen enough places in the world to know that this is the country that I want to live in. I was born here, I live here. I like to travel outside of here, but this is where this is it for me. I've seen other systems and other places. I think that we have not progressed as far as we should have in with certain groups of people in this country. And that makes it hard when you're trying to uh, translate this idea of patriotism to, to, to other people. But I think that it starts in your household. You have to come from a household where people actually have a view of this country that in spite of, we still got to work, we still got to, and the historical context of the people who laid the groundwork for us before. I stand on the shoulders of the women from the 6 I stand on these that's, women's and shoulders. That's, that's an incredible story, and uh, veteran radio listeners, if you don't know about the uh, 6 I've got a podcast interview on that. Uh, go search it. It's an incredible story uh, from World War II. Yes, indeed. And, and and the fact that if these women had not sacrificed in spite of, how long would it have taken for black women to have been able to serve this country in any any branch? But I, my father was a, a, a veteran, and all of my father's male siblings served in some capacity, and well, all of them were in the Army. And so it was it was, for me, something I grew up with. You know, I grew up with it, and it was in the household. It was in in my community. But, of course, now coming through an era where you see these Vietnam service members, it was a conflicted time, but I also had relatives that served in World War II. And I I would listen to the banter between the two groups. To be a patriot means that that you're, you're not here to harm your community or harm the members in your community in any form of fashion or those in society. To be a patriot means you need to be a law-abiding citizen. Law-abiding. Law-abiding. To be a patriot, you need to be productive. Whatever your your intelligences allow you to do and whatever your physical capabilities allow you to do, to be a contributor to the success in your household, in your neighborhood, in your community. To me, that's patriotism, uh, being patri- being patriotic, because I'm not here to say that I agree with everything in our government. And there are times that one party says something and I'm just cringing and I'm really just clicked out in a different direction and the opposite side as well. I don't think any party, left or right, A, B, C, or D, has all the answers. I But I do make my, a point to stay involved with seeing what issues are at hand, and although I can't do the correction at maybe at the national level, what can we do at our local levels? And that's where I think the mark is being missed. People don't understand the importance of local government. Yeah, Gunny, I think you're right. It starts in the home and local communities. If your local community doesn't recognize and support military service, as you say, being, being law-abiding, then it's unlikely that uh, the, the community is going to be supportive of, of military service. You went from being in the Marines, uh, career in policing, career in education, 
Uh, did you get the opportunity to use the GI Bill to get some of your education? Unfortunately, and this is where information doesn't get passed well, when I joined, they had stopped the GI Bill, and they had this program called the VEEK program. Oh, yeah, which that, was was, a that, that, was a, that was a horrible one. Very, very much so, because I could not benefit from it, although I, when you, if you pay the amount, what happened was that when I went to college, I was fortunate enough to get a lot of scholarships. I got all kinds of scholarships for academics. I got a ton of scholarships. I got a scholarship for broadcasting. I had all kinds of scholarships because when they used my education benefit, what they did was they sent me a $114 check a month. And I was not able to access the other benefits that they had put in, although I found out afterwards that I should have been able to cross over to a I think it was a Montgomery Mon GI Bill. It was, yeah, that was next. Montgomery was next, yep. They did not tell us. Some of the, the units did not tell you. You did not know. And my chagrin is that the VA does not allow you to go back and grandfather the people who did not get the word. That's we didn't what, get the information. That's really why it's important that the work that the VSOs do, such as the American Legions, VFW, DAV, um, because it's a complex set of benefits that veterans have, and it changes over time. And what didn't work at one point might work later on, and you need somebody who knows what they're talking about to help guide you. And the other thing I find is, you know, when you're telling uh, an 18-year-old or a 24-year-old uh, kid what his benefits are, they don't, they're not even hearing you. So it's really important when it's time to really look at these things to go back and that's why your work with the American Legion and some of the other uh, groups you've mentioned is so important and I, I suspect you feel the same way I, I do feel the same way I just wish that uh, I wish moreover that we would see more productive turnaround for claims because they're, they're, they're swamp I mean they are swamp and they're swamp for any number of reasons I wish that when a person says that I have been sexually assaulted, that they don't have to go through so many people to continually be, to be, you know, to tell the story over and over again. I've had women who, and men, whom have been traumatized, and then afterwards they get triggered by telling this person who's typing this stuff out or listening, and then I have to go, I, well, I don't have to, but I go to the hospital and I visit them or I take them there or, or talk them down so that they don't go back in that deep place, I wish that we had uh, more physical access locations for some of these veteran service organizations to have house, you know, physical structures. I think that if we had communities that really were focused more on on veterans affairs and dealing with the veterans, because veterans organizations, National Black um, um, Military Women, American Legion. We have tenants that we actually do community work, and but to try to purchase buildings and maintain buildings, and you know it's it's hard. So that means that we're all stretched out trying to come together for common causes and common goals. And where we do, the idea is that you have all these vacant buildings in these locations where we're 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 nonprofit organizations, and there's a whole lot of benefit a community would have by allowing organizations to have these structures. Let us rehab them and use them so they'll be purposeful for the entire community. And one, one of the things that can be done with an association like the National Association of Black Military Women or any of the VSOs we've been mentioning is that you have a voice in those associations that's much powerful, more powerful than the individual's voice because it's a collective voice and it's heard more at in Washington or the state capitals and what have you. Certainly. Um, when you talk about the makeup of the military, our United States Armed Forces should be a microcosm of our society. And if our society is made up of 13% of one group, then the military should be 13% of that same group, at least to hit that mark. And when you have students that want to go to Harvard or University of Michigan or the University of Akron, you sign papers, you, you pay the tuition, you go to school, you get your grades, and you get your diploma. That's quid pro quo. I do something, you do something in return. 
in the military, when you go to these military academies, it's a little different. And this is why the race must be, because the mission of the students who attend military academy goes beyond the walls of academia. The persons who sign up to say that I'm going to go to the military academy is saying, I'm also signing up to give X number of years of my life in service. When we look at the numbers of, of persons who serve, we notice that there's a difference. I can speak heartily to this when you find at least one face that looks familiar to you versus being in a whole base and none. I know that when I was in, General Peterson was a gentleman that I worked for. He was the first black general in the Marine Corps, first one. But General Peterson, I met up with him at Quantico, and every person who's attached to Quantico as a general knows that they're the base commander. That was their twilight tour. And as great as he was, he knew that he was never getting promoted beyond that, and his chances of ever becoming the coming out of the Marine Corps were ditched. 246 years, the Marine Corps never had a black person as, as a commandant of the Marine Corps at all, or the assistant commandant. This is 2024 now. That's just un unrealistic to think about. But even now, you only have one person that could ever be that, and that was the gentleman who was who was uh, well, the Marine that was promoted two years ago. The military academies must factor in because there are in their obligation is to ensure to ensure that the military looks like society and that the military must function in a way that a student coming out of Harvard doesn't have to deal with, a student coming out of Michigan doesn't have to deal with. If I go inside of a Walmart or Walgreens and every every pharmacist is is, is Caucasian or Indian or whatever, it's not going to affect me more right next because they're giving me medicine. They, I'm going home. I'm leaving out. But in the military, I'm having to have a sense of comfort about the person dealing with my life in my hands. And you don't want to have people in places where they don't see that they can ascribe to be at that level. The military academy's assignment is different. Their mission is different. The focus is different. And therefore, you must at least know who you're getting coming in. I know that it's not the main issue. I know that it's not the, the overall arcing issue, but it must be considered because the military is not the civilian society. No, uh, it's, no it, it, it has an obligation to protect the entire country. That's right. However, That's it's, absolutely. however it's made up. And, and one of the things the National Association of Black Military Women is doing is uh, supporting some lit, uh, federal lawsuits that are calling for uh, clarity on this issue of affirmative action at the service academies. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out because it has big social, political issues related to it. I'm going to stop the interview here. We have the full podcast up on our website, veteransradio.org, because I wanted to bring in a little piece of information that's developed since uh, two weeks ago or so when we made the interview, and that uh, the lawsuits that the National Association of Black Women Veterans uh, is involved in. The U.S. Supreme Court has declined to block the U.S. Military Academy at West Point from considering race as a factor in admissions, uh, while the legal battle down below proceeds in the lower court. People were arguing, hey, don't use race this coming uh, year of admissions. And the Supreme Court said, Hey, stay down below. You're in the trial court. You're in the Court of Appeals. Develop the record. We'll look at it at a future point. So uh, that's a very recent development that we wanted to pass along in conjunction with this uh, interview, which I hope you enjoyed and, and understand the perspective of the National Association of Black Women Veterans. Let's have a few words from our sponsor, and then we'll get to the other side. Military veterans touch everyone's life. I'm guessing right now you're thinking of a veteran, a close friend, relative, Maybe it's you. Even the toughest of us sometimes need help, but don't know where to turn for support. You don't need special training to help a veteran in your life. Even small actions can make a world of difference. If you know a veteran in crisis, please call the Veterans Crisis Line, 800-273-8255. 800-273-8255. A message from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at one 800 693 
1-800-273-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We always want to thank our sponsors for keeping us on the air now 20 years, uh, including the VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America Chapter 310, the Charles S. Kettles Chapter in Ann Arbor, the VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423, and the American Legion Press Corps Post 46. You can help us on Veterans Radio by going to veteransradio.org and clicking on the Donate button, uh, whether it's 20 bucks for our 20 years or something more substantial, or if you'd like to be a corporate or business sponsor, reach out to us. We'd love to have you on board. We're going to move now, I said earlier, to something a little more historical, and I thought uh, this would be interesting for folks here um, during uh, the Black History Month. We got to talk to an author, Jill Newmark, who wrote a book that focused on the African-American surgeons during the Civil War. I think it's a great uh, book that uh, gives you this sort of whole look at how difficult it was to become a surgeon uh, in the military at that point in time and the struggles that folks had to go through. So listening to this, I think you're going to find it a slice of history you really haven't heard before. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today Jill L. Newmark, an author, uh, uh, has written a fascinating book. Jill, welcome to Veterans Radio. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to... uh, to talk about my book, uh, especially on veterans radio, I have uh, my father was in the service for a long time as well as a lot of his relatives. So, well, not I a long a, time. He uh, spent yeah. 37 years in the Mil- United States Air Force and was a chief master yes. sergeant. So, uh, you, you come from that kind of uh, uh, upbringing. Yeah. And your book, without concealment, without compromise, the courageous lives of Black Civil War surgeons is really kind of unique. I don't think we've ever talked about anything close to this on Veterans Radio, which is why I said, oh, i got to talk to Jill. Um, yeah. This book apparently has its roots in some work that you were doing for the National Library of Medicine back in 2009, and you stumbled on one of these stories and said, hmm, I wonder what's going on here. But it was like a yep. 15-year odyssey to put this together, wasn't it? Yeah, um, you know, from that time until the published book, obviously, uh, you know, it takes a little, uh, a little, a little time, and um, uh, that exhibition um, just piqued my curiosity, as you mentioned, and um, I was on my way. And you know, just like any kind of genealogist, when you're doing a biography, you can keep going and going and going, and you keep trying to find these little pieces and trying to put them together. So whether the story is ever really completely told is is you know you you there's always new things to find but it was a a a journey and um of discovery and um exploration and i hope that it uh it will bring these stories to light uh on these accomplishments of these black surgeons i think it really does and i think it's uh should be of interest to civil war buffs to medical uh buffs medical history buffs surgeons uh, to those interested in the uh, civil rights uh, issues and veterans in general because I found some themes that kind of run down all the way to today uh, with yes. all of these men. And, and one of them was they all had an overwhelming desire to practice medicine and nothing was going to stop him. It wasn't easy, was it, for them to become doctors? No, it wasn't easy. At that time, becoming a doctor was... Um, a little bit different than today. You could do an apprenticeship with a physician for five, six, seven years, and then go ahead and practice medicine. It did not necessarily require a medical degree, but for these black men, in order for them to be seen and recognized as physicians, they really did need to get medical degrees. And it was because of the fact they had medical degrees that they were allowed to eventually serve uh, during the Civil War as surgeons um, to the United States Colored Troops and to black civilians. And we have to put in some context to really understand this story that the Civil War was 1861 to 1865, April of those years, for the first year or so, blacks could not join into the, the military. Finally, in 1862, you have the signing of the uh, D.C. Emancipation Proclamation, and in January 1st of 1863, Lincoln signs the Emancipation Declaration, and right. blacks are more welcomed into 
fighting for the uh, the North, if you will, and uh, yep. you mentioned the term that I think today would would jar somebody's ear, but it was the term used at the time, um, which are the colored troops. Yes, um, and and I I um, I have to say that I don't know necessarily if they were so much that they were more welcome. I think what happened is is as the war, you know, went on and they used all their resources. You know, there were fewer white men to serve. And that's it goes for the Confederacy also, but in the Union Army. And I think that they realized that they needed to recruit black men who were anxious to, to participate and wanted to participate. And they knew that they would not be successful in winning the war unless they recruited and used black troops. And at the time, when they started to, after the, uh, in January 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation was, was, um, was passed, it really, a lot of people think it freed all the slaves. It did not. It freed all the slaves in the rebellion states. Um, And so, but as a result of that, they formed the United States Colored Troops when they realized that they really needed to recruit more uh, soldiers. I think there were almost 200,000 black soldiers that served, which was about maybe 10% of the uh, U.S. Army at that time. And at some point, it also became obvious that they needed uh, black or colored surgeons to uh, address the uh, colored troops that were serving. But I want to back up to the the apprenticeship and the formal education, because one of the themes that kind of runs through this is the difficulty all of these men had in getting that formal education uh, at schools in both in the U primarily the problems were in the US but but some of them went to Canada yes. some of them went to England again going back to if if you really want to do this they found a way to get that formal education but it was not yes. without uh, problems was it no it was not um, mo- uh, first of all most of these men came from uh, families that had some affluence so um, they were they it, that allowed them to be able to travel to places, uh, gave them a little bit more freedom to do that. They were all f- uh, born free, but um, it was difficult. Um, Alexander Augusta, who was the first um, African American commissioned as a medical officer in the U.S. Army, he wanted to go to medical school and had gone. He was from Norfolk, Virginia. He went to uh, Pennsylvania, um, where his brother lived. And he wanted to go to school there, uh, but he could not get into medical school there. He had a mentor um, that worked with him who who was a professor at uh, University of Pennsylvania, but he was um, blocked completely. And, you know, that was that was a little earlier than some of the others. But um, he ended up going to Canada because that's where he was able to get a medical education. Um, it's all, it's also so it's, interesting it's that difficult. some of so it's also Jill interesting uh, that some of them have sort of a, a career in front of getting the, either the apprenticeship or the formal medical education, whether it be a dentist or a barber. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, I think um, there's a, a few a few of them um, did have some other roles. So so um, for black men, being a barber was a fairly good uh, job because they could make some money. And I think that uh, for Alexander Augusta, his brother was a barber, and I think he became a barber, maybe a surgeon barber, and surgeon barbers did other things like pull teeth and and, did, and leech treatments where they put leeches on to draw blood. Um, so I think that, um, you know, they they did do that, and I think for Augusta, this was a way to get enough money to get a tutor to teach him about medicine and also to go to medical school. Um, John H. Rapier Jr., who was, I think, maybe 10 years uh, younger, um, he did some traveling before he went to medical school, and he went to the Caribbean, to Haiti and Jamaica, looking really for a place where blacks could have a better life. And while he was there, he apprenticed with a dentist, so that was his way of learning about dentistry, and he was going to be a dentist. And then he decided that he felt that being a doctor um, would be more prestigious and would give him more money in order to help support his father and his 
uh, his uh, brothers and sisters. And so he did an apprenticeship with that, with a, uh, another doctor in, uh, in the Caribbean. And from that, he was able to go to medical school in the U.S., but his story is a little bit more interesting in terms of his acceptance it is. into a medical yeah. program. Yeah, he, he was rejected by the University of Michigan. after He was accepted and then rejected because all the other white medical students got uh, in an uproar. Well, well, actually, what actually happened was is that there were two black medical students there at the time. And when John H. Rapier Jr. Got, uh, was, um, uh, you know, was accepted as a student there, um, um, you know, they 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 always want to know where you're from. And what he did is he said that he was from Jamaica. So they looked upon him as a foreign man of color. There was another man named Alpheus W. Tucker, who was from Detroit, who also got accepted to the um, um, to the medical school there. And he he is he's actually the one that got yelled at when he attended the class by the way. He got kicked out, and I think the difference was this was they saw him as a black man from Detroit, and they looked at Rapier as a black man from Jamaica, and therefore he was a foreigner, and their attitude was a little bit different about that. But you know, when they applied and they got into medical schools, it didn't mean they were accepted as students. That you know, you can you can get in and you you've applied and they've they've accepted you you know as um as a medical student but you're not always accepted by the medical students yeah absolutely absolutely it's a again i one of the themes throughout all of these uh, gentlemen's uh, stories is the uh, express and subtle ways in which prejudice uh, creeps into their life whether it's in trying to get their education or practicing their profession but one of the yes. things that also rings true through this as a theme is sort of the status that being an officer provided them the uniform provided them in in certain circumstances mm-hmm. but i was surprised that uh, this difference between being a contract officer and a commission officer can you explain that yes um the difference uh, was that at the time with surgeons, you were either commissioned into the military. Alexander T. Augusta and John Van Surly de Grasse were, there are 14 black surgeons. Only two of them were actually commissioned officers in the Union Army. The others were hired on contract by the Army as acting assistant surgeons. They were given a rank and they were given uniforms, but they were not formally in the military. So, you know, they, 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 um, they were just considered on contract with the army. And I believe that they did that. Um, it gave the US army and the US government a way of easily getting rid of them if they needed to, because if you're on contract, you can, you can uh, you nullify the contract and out you go. If you're, uh, you know, if you're a commissioned officer, it takes a little bit more to remove you from your position. And again, that's one of those subtle forms of uh, discrimination bias that they yes. had to overcome to ply yes. their trade. And and certainly this was a high profession as it is today, being a doctor, being a surgeon. Yeah. Uh, at that time, you know, they were at uh, as as black surgeons in the military, uh, mm-hmm. contract or commission. They were sort of at the top of the social pyramid. Uh, in their yes. communities. What? Yes, they were. And also, you know, within the Army, because they were getting paid, I think, $100 a month. And $100 a month in 1863, 64 was a lot of money, you know. Um, and so, um, y- you know, it, it was a question of, um, uh, I-, I believe that because of some of the difficulties that Augusta faced at the beginning and the, um, the, the way that the white surgeons um, complained, I think the U.S. Army decided that they were not going to commission any more officers and they were just going to get them on contract. And that didn't stop them. It, a lot of times it was subtle, but in a lot of times it was not subtle at all. One of the, the other just, things, you know, yeah, this is the, the prejudice I'm talking about, and part of it is in their assignments. Talk to us a little bit about 
the type of assignments these various uh, mm -hmm. surgeons received as compared to maybe what others did? Yeah, sure. When you go through the federal records, all the assignments of these black surgeons, except for one, were all at um, black-only hospitals that served only black patients, both from the United States Colored Troops, soldiers, as well as black civilians. So either they were at hospitals that were for black patients only, or they were also assigned to recruiting stations examining black recruits when they were joining the United States Colored Troops. The only one that was um, that was uh, served in the field was John Van Surly de Grasse, and his experience was very difficult. He faced lots of uh, blatant discrimination, and um, and eventually they brought him up on what I consider dubious charges of drunkenness and insubordination, and they cashiered him out. So he was. Um, court-martialed out because of that and if you if you do read all the court martial transcripts which are at the National Archives in Washington um, it's pretty clear that they really didn't have much of a case but this was the way they could get him out now the other um, um, Alexander T. Augusta was assigned now you have to keep in mind John Van Shirley de Grasse was an assistant surgeon so I think he was a lieutenant but when Augusta, who was the first, he was in, given the rank of major because he was a full surgeon. And when he um, eventually he was assigned as the regimental surgeon to the seventh regiment of the United States Colored Troops. And when his troops mustered in, they rustered in with three other regiments of the Colored Troops, um, all of whom had white assistant surgeons. And so Augusta was the ranking senior surgeon when he arrived there. They wrote a letter to President Lincoln complaining about being in a position, being subordinate to a black man, which they felt was, was um, unacceptable, although they expressed their support for the advancement of the colored people in the U.S., but they couldn't stand for having him as the um, ranking medical officer and although we don't know if Lincoln ever responded, Augusta was removed from that location and sent to examine black recruits in Baltimore. The difference is, is that he was never removed as the regimental surgeon. So he remained that. They never replaced him with the regiment. You, so. you, your book does a great job of, of talking about uh... – Degrassi's uh, charges on really what mm -hmm. sound like made-up drunkenness charges and as one, yes. of, one of those, uh, okay, this is how we get rid of somebody we don't like. Um, yes, and, and, and it was clear, yeah, it was very clear because there were a few people that had written, in, written letters saying that they weren't going to join up again if this was the case and he should be removed. And um, one, it's very interesting because one of the instances that they claimed that he was drunk was at the Battle of Alusti. And um, the, the lieutenant colonel who was the commanding officer at the time was wounded at the battle and the surgeon was treating him. But what he did is he transferred the care of this commanding officer to de Grasse in order to accompany him to Jacksonville to get him on a ship to bring him north to like a hospital in South Carolina. And it's and it seems inconceivable that the surgeon in charge would have transferred the commanding officer's care to a doctor that was drunk. But this is Abs what they claim. Absolutely, and, and if he did, he should have been court-martialed. But but exactly. again, it's it's some of that subtle discrimination that comes out of this. It's interesting, yes. and and even today, you you know, there are there are service members of every race and color and creed who say, "I got picked on by my superiors," and this is one of, of the course. you know they gave me an Article 15 or something. This is one of the things they did to me. And and, and again, these kind of themes run through here uh one of the uh gentlemen uh dr powell jr um fought for 25 years trying to get his invalid pension uh, yes. and, and died before he was ever given and i can tell you as a as a lawyer working with veterans and disability none of them want to go 25 years trying to get their their disability yes. payment or pension and when i read that i got oh my goodness we still do some of the same goofy stuff today T tell us yeah. about uh dr powell jr yeah he was um he was 
uh, had a um, his father was an African American and his mother was a Native American from they were from New Bedford, Massachusetts, and his father was a um, a staunch abolitionist and very well known, and um, he ran a boarding house for black black sailors and uh, part of the Underground Railroad, both in New Bedford and in New York City. And so Powell grew up um, w with, um, you know, abolitionists and with all of this discussion in, in, in his home. And I think his father and both his father and mother were, were um, you know, were people that he looked up to and followed kind of in their footsteps. So he was determined to get a pension. Um, you know, it's, it's because, questionable. Because it was the right thing to do. And he had had that core yes. belief instilled in him yes. from childhood that if this is the right thing to do, you keep fighting forever on it. And he, and he, exactly. as I said, he did for 25 years till his death in 1916. Exactly. 16, uh, and he, you know, what he would do is he would get rejected and then the rules would change. And then, you know, because at first it was, you had to be injured, you know, during, during the war to be, um, uh, have, be, be able to get a pension. And then it changed to old age as pensionable. So he would do this and he would get medical examinations and he would get depositions. But you also have to keep in mind that a lot of the depositions came from other black physicians and or black people. And at the time, people did not take uh, depositions the, they questioned the credibility of black witnesses. So that was that was something that came along. But it wasn't as if other contract surgeons, there were some contract surgeons that were white that got pensions, um, but there was definitely some discrimination going on there. And, you know, he was he was determined. He he felt that he had served his country and this is what was due him. Uh, and he needed the pension. We're talking to uh, Jill L. Newmark who wrote, Without Concealment, Without Compromise, The Courageous Lives of Black Civil War Surgeons. And we won't have enough time to talk about all these gentlemen. I want folks to read this. You're going to read about uh, Dr. Uh, Anderson Abbott, who uh, went to the White House reception with uh, Abe and Mary Lincoln. Um, so they're weaved into this are all kinds of interesting stories about uh, going to... Um, uh, Richard Green, the only doctor in this group who's not uh, not in the Army. He's with the Navy, he had a Yale education, and then uh, on to Dartmouth Medical School. Um, very, very, every one of these guys, one's a preacher uh, who became a physician, um, have very interesting individual stories, but when you put them all together, as I say, these themes run through. I want to talk about Benjamin Bozeman for a moment because I think he highlights post-service transition and success, which a right. number of these doctors had, but again, kind of relates to people who get out of the service today, go on and do really successful things. Tell us about Dr. Uh, Bozeman. Yes, he was actually um, uh, from New York, from Troy, New York, but he joined uh, when he, you know, he went to medical school and he had a, a short term in the service uh, in South Carolina where he treated... Um, uh, wounded soldiers and six soldiers from the 21st Regiment of the USCT. But after after the war, he stayed in South Carolina, and he wanted he was interested in, in improving himself, in moving himself up the ladder of social ladder, um, and and gaining some financial success, and looked at different opportunities. And one of those was that. Um, he became um, a member of the South Carolina legislature, which, you know, after Reconstruction, there was the, the right to vote for black men. And they, you know, there was a, a lot of black men that wanted to become politically active. And he served there. Um, he, he, he maintained a, a medical practice. But then he went on to become the first black postmaster of Charleston. Um, Appo appointed by a President Ulysses Grant. This was a fascinating discussion uh, with Jill Newmark regarding Civil War surgeons, black surgeons, and as I said, you could kind of feel some of the same themes our veterans face today, um, whether it be uh, bias or prejudice, uh, the challenges of being in service, the, the transition out of service, those sorts of things, all, all very similar 
uh, rippling through time from the Civil War all the way down to today. So I hope you enjoyed that little bit of uh, unusual history that uh, you probably have not heard about before. I didn't know anything about the difference between contract surgeons and and those who had the commissions. So that was sort of uh, an interesting piece as well. So, and that's what we try to do for you on Veterans Radio is bring you unique information about uh, veteran stories, both present day and historically. Try to put some context around it, give you some things to think about in today's world and maybe reflect, hmm, we need to make some more changes. We're not so far along as we thought we were. But uh, if you've got story ideas or people we should interview, let us know on veteransradio.org. Send to Dale or Jim at veteransradio.org. We'd be glad to get your input on those sorts of things. Uh, We want to thank our major national sponsor, National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, the nation's leading certification firm for veteran-owned businesses. We really appreciate their continuous support. And we'll be back uh, next week at this time. Uh, But you can always find us on the web at veteransradio.org where you can get uh, any of our programs. We've got over 600 up uh, that you can listen to at uh, your leisure on the web. One of those programs that I wanted to get on today's show but just ran out of time was an interesting discussion about how... um, Sergeant Majors, uh, black women have built a culture, and they are now over, a, or they're roughly 50% of the Army's Sergeant Majors. So, a very interesting story there with Eden Stratton. You might want to go listen to that on our website. So, uh, just, just a lot of things we don't actually get a chance to bring them all to air. We need your support to keep doing this. But uh, no, no shortage of great stories. So, until next time on Veterans Radio. You are dismissed. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. (gasps) No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.